Farzi, I'm wondering for the podcast this week and maybe next week, do you think I could do it with my camera off just because I shaved off the beard in order to grow a mustache to raise awareness for men's health? And I hate the look of my face. <laughs> Let's be honest right now, Popey. Both of us should do podcasts with our cameras off yeah. at all times. We should probably walk around with paper bags over our heads, which, by the way, fans did at a time, not just at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, but at the Kitchener Memorial Auditorium. It happened back in the not so heydays of the Rangers franchise. It's probably a good policy for the both of us. Uh, and since you brought that up, by the way, you look you look stunning. Anybody watching on YouTube can see that, as always. A I bald think... head? It's too much skin, man. <laughs> the, oh, our, much our skin. Our... Our guest that you're going to hear from in a little bit on this podcast, uh, he and I had hopped on the call a couple of minutes before you, so a little bit of idle chit chat, and uh, and he made reference to my haircut being the same as another guy that we were talking about, and I said, "Well, wait till Chris jumps jumps on the call, because then you're going to see another one, because yeah. this is what Chris and I are doing." But I shaved just... my sorry, I shaved my beard yesterday uh, in anticipation of Movember. Yeah. Um, donate on my Twitter page, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I walk upstairs. I didn't tell Kate I was doing it. I walk upstairs. Oh. She goes, oh, 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 and I'm like, oh, this is how you really feel about my face. Keep, nice keep partner. it covered. Keep it covered as much as possible. That's oh, all she asks. Yeah. Wait till uh, she gets the big mustache. You just made me think the, the dirty, greasy mustache yeah. is what it's going to be. Exactly. Like, oh, my goodness. It's a duster to end all dusters. This is I dread this month. Like, I, I'll throw some money your way, as I always do. But honestly. If I could, I pay you one month to not grow it. No, I love a mustache. I'd rock it all the time if I didn't look so perverted. Exactly. I'd be like walking my niece, and they'd be like, "Are you okay, miss?" I'm like, "Yes, just out for a walk with my uncle." I was going to save this for a little bit later in the uh, podcast as we get things started for this week, but since you brought up the idea of you know us and cameras, and I mentioned covering our faces, I might the next time I go to the WFCU center i i might go in with a paper bag over my head just in shame i'm feeling a little bit of the the guilt but it was a so i'm just gonna i'll just start it flat out this way and, and apologize to the social media team and, and the rest of the folks in windsor this shocks you this surprises clip you it. why clip because it why apologizing well i, I feel admitting wrongdoing well i don't know about wrongdoing necessarily oh. I, but i feel okay. a little bit bad listen it was not um it was a, it was a much different experience in windsor we were just there this past weekend prior to uh recording this podcast and let's just be honest the, the broadcast location um if what we had was a 10 and it was pretty close uh we've now got about a 2 when it comes to the setup in in windsor and and it's kind of unfortunate and uh it left us in a, in a really tough spot when we had to set up our gear and the way with the connection only allowed us so much room to move away from one end of this broadcast location. So I shared a picture on, on social media at Farwell underscore OHL for all the fun and games around the league for the year, but uh, of a partially obstructed view from the broadcast booth, uh, we did, you know, shift a little bit, and make things a little better, but it doesn't change the fact you got to lean forward to make sure you can see one end of the ice. And uh, it was just a, uh, that wasn't the perfect night. And I think these guys who I didn't know at the time were the Windsor Spitfire social media account guys who were sitting, I don't know, maybe 20 feet down to our right. And I guess they saw my post and then we went back and forth. A little bit of a dueling tweets for a while. Guys, I, I'm i sorry. I, I didn't mean anything by it. We survived. It was a little frustrating getting set up in the new location. Don't love the new location. I'm not going to lie to you. But we've, uh, we've talked on the road about um, habits and you may be an extreme creature of habit just and when things tend to not be normal and what you're used to it bothers you a great deal put it this way that's true that is very true and and more as i get older and i honestly as a personal shortcoming i work on this clearly i still need a lot of work but our old broadcast location in windsor was so good they're converting it into a luxury suite so that's what we had and now we've got, I don't even know what to call it really. It's like, if you've ever been to Hamilton to go to the gondola at Cops and you have to go across that catwalk to get there, we're basically on that catwalk. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where we broadcast from now. It's fine. It does the trick. But it, it is was, fine. It was much different. 
And you know what? what? We're back. That's what yes, I keep saying. I know, We're but back. damn it. Can I not have a bad night? Months. Can I you have can. a Okay, I did. Sure, but I d- just on this, we and we, uh, for, for people who are watching or listening, we did not talk about talking about this at all before doing this podcast. No. But I, I mentioned the creature of habit, and maybe you got it from working with your former partner, Don Cameron. Can you please tell the creature of habit story when you started working with Don and wanted to carry the heavy box? Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. And I've got another one to follow that up on. Sure. That's a, that's a good memory, Popper. Yeah, thank you. So the, the box that our gear that we take from broadcast location to broadcast location is housed in is I've always joked that you could drop it from the international space station and it would land on earth completely intact. Like it is, it is heavy duty and emphasis on the heavy. It is not a light piece of equipment. So I would always see when I started working with Don, and this is more than 10 years ago now, but he would have been in his 70s at the time. And he would always carry this box around. So he would never say anything, of course. And I'm just going to be, look, not only am I the rookie, I'm I'm also, you know, 40 years his junior. I'm going to, well, 30 years. Anyway, I'm going to carry the box. It's just the way that's going to be. So, so I would, make sure that I picked up the box every time, got the gear all set up, et cetera, before a game, even on home games. And, and it got to the point where I realized he started going to home games earlier than me so he could get the box and he could take it all the way up to the broadcast booth in Kitchener and he could set it up. So it became, in the beginning, it was almost like a little contest. The next thing I know, it's 3.45 on a Friday afternoon. And I'm like, I I can't go any earlier. Like how much earlier do I have to go to the rink to beat this old man to the rink? So he'll let me carry the gear and set it up. So I learned my lesson then and, and I got out of the way. I'm like, you know what? Much like I think you have begun to learn. Yep. Harwell's being particular in this case. I'm like, this is Don's thing. Part of his game day routine is getting to the rink, carrying that heavy gear up to the booth, setting it up himself. That's part of his ritual. He gets to have it. And then we made the compromise on the road that we take turns. One of us carries it into the arena. One of us carries it out. And then eventually he just let me carry it all the time. But for home games, don't get in the way. Don gets there plenty early. He's got his way to do it. He'll carry it upstairs and set it all up. And like I said, I would have started going to the rink at three 30 in order to beat him to the rink. And it was just so funny to notice that he was going earlier than me because he didn't want me to take that gear. The other time it hit me. I, I, just real quick, I yeah. would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the room the first day he shows up and you already have the gear set up. I bet you, you set him off on an inner fire, like just furious at you. You are so, you probably, I don't know. He, of course, he never said a word. No. We never actually talked about this, but it was obvious because I knew if I'm going to take the gear up, because he was always very good about being at the rink super early. So I'm five minutes earlier than him. The next thing I know, I get there and he's already got it set up. So I go a little earlier and that's how the game went. We never spoke of it, but I recognized, figured it out. The other time, <laughs> I remember this, we used to drive to Guelph together as you and I do now, because what's the point of hopping on the bus for a 20 minute trip? And so we would take turns driving, you know, he uses the gas the one time, I used the gas the next time, whatever. And uh, the first time I drove, I drove what I would call my way. I used to live in Guelph. I had a way that I thought would, I, I used to work. That, that was my first OHL job was with the Guelph Storm. I know how to get to the rink. And so we're driving from Kitchener to Guelph, Highway 7, like you would do. But I turned on the Hanlon as opposed to staying on Woodlawn all the way down to Woolwich, like Don, like Don did, probably Woolwich in uh, Guelph. Anyway. So as soon as I make that turn onto the Hanlon, I see Don in the passenger seat, starts, you know, shifting a little bit, getting a little agitated. He's like, oh, you take a different way. I'm like, yeah, yeah, Don, I'm just going to go up here and get off at Paisley and, you know, oh, yeah, okay. And then a couple more times before we got to the rink, oh, so this is the way you go. Yeah, Don, anyway the last time I went that way and then from then on every time we went we did take turns driving but I always drove the exact way that Don drove and to this day you know it when I'm driving I drive the same way Woodlawn to Woolwich and over to the rink that way because that's how Don did it and that's what we do I always just put it <laughs> in my phone I don't I don't want to waste mind space I'm like I don't know phone will take me the right way sure fair enough yeah. I that just the creature of habit it made me think that uh, <laughs> that Don story and of course 
his creature of habit of carrying that giant barbell of a case up heavy up the seven thousand stairs in the odd actually led him to busting his head open once yeah and (laughs) And still calling a game that happened early on like all those stairs it was down near the bottom when he got it caught on a railing and because it's so heavy it threw him off balance backwards he goes boy that was a night because i got a i got a phone call from danny liebold the rangers head trainer because he had don in his room stitching him up and so I get there, the first place I go is to the room. And I'm, I'm telling you, like, it, the, the Don was a mess. He's got blood still coming down his head. He's got blood on the shirt. And 70 something again. In his 70s. Yep. And, and he is, he's got no plans to, to not call this game. And again, because he knows now, though, that he's stuck on the trainer's table. Until he's done being stitched, he gets cleaned up a little bit. So I have to pick up some of the slack, if you will, to get the pregame show ready, which I don't give a tinker's darn about. I'm watching Don. I'm looking at blood on his head. I'm like, dude. And so, but he was frustrated then because he knew he couldn't do his usual job. I said, Don, you stay here. I'll come back and check in with Danny a little bit. I got everything taken care of. I got to have to take the gear upstairs and set it up and all this stuff. And he anyway, must have been pissed. oh, he, but, <laughs> but. The man called the game and and one of Don's uh, traits was that he always stood during games. He stood through the whole game. In fact, can I tell this story too? That reminds me of the night that he didn't stand. And so that was so strange. Like I knew he had been sounding a little bit. (laughs) Don, I love you. Honest, I do, but I, I'm going to tell the whole. I'm going to tell the whole story here, whole thing. His voice had sounded a little. You could just tell he wasn't quite himself. And then all of a sudden, this night, he was sitting during the game, and I'm like, okay, something's going on. And I would always like, things okay? How you doing? Just you know, because when I noticed the difference in his voice, everything was no, nope, it's fine, it's fine, fine. So this night again, I'm like, how you doing? Well, I, I don't know. If there's a flu. It's cold. I don't know. He's he's sucking some cough candies. And he's sitting down. This was a Friday night. On the Saturday, we were scheduled to go to Erie. And I got a call that morning about 930 uh, on the Saturday morning. And Don was at St. Mary's Hospital. So he phoned me because, because again, what's Don's number one priority? Call me, make sure we're covered for the game. You're going to have to get somebody. I'm not going to be able to go to the game. I'm like, Okay, but now I'm a little bit concerned here because the night before it's cough candies and maybe mm-hmm. a boat of the flu. So as I'm trying to arrange with the radio station, somebody else to come to the game, I went to, I went to the hospital to check in on Don because the man's in the hospital. And of course, he drove himself there the night before. But he, and forgive me because I'm, I'm not a doctor and I can't remember what the name of whatever it was. It was some kind of, of viral infection, but <laughs> I, I loved Don like a member of the family. He was like a second father to me. But I never, I never needed to hear the words come out of Don's mouth that his testicle had swollen up like a football. <laughs> but that's what he You're told me. You're telling the whole story. I told the whole story. So, but just imagine that. So 12 hours prior, he's calling a game, albeit whilst sitting down and sucking on cough candies. And then he's in the hospital with a testicle swollen up the size of a football. He felt the need to share this with me. Checked in. The doctor said he's just fine. We're going to got we got some, you know, uh, antibiotics. He's going to be just fine. I got to get on a bus to go to Erie with some schlub who's now a regional police officer and who's working with us at the time. And, and that was that. But yeah, boy, that went that went in a slightly different direction. It all started with uh, Don and I are a little particular. Yeah, he, yeah. he probably sat down because he felt like he was going to fall over standing up. <laughs> So, you know, he wasn't a big fella. 14 stitches to the melon or the squash. That's what the guys always joke about. I think it was Mike Van Ryan was the quote. How's Don squash? How's his his squash? So he gets 14 stitches, calls the game while standing. Whatever viral infection was bothering him to the point that his testicles swelled up like a football, he calls the game sitting, but still calls the game. The next day he had to, he had to bail. Listen, we, we were going to talk about the Sioux. We were going to talk about the road trip up there. We were going to talk about everything. I, th- I think this is a perfect intro. 
Don Cameron, ahead of our guest this week. I think we can save the stuff from our trip to the Sioux. We can save our stuff from the trip to Windsor other than the broadcast position. I think it's just perfect. We had a couple of Don stories, which are always welcome on this podcast. And if you have a Don story, please let us know. We love to hear them. Um, But I think it's just a perfect segue. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right. Again, sincere apologies to the crew in Windsor. I love you. You're doing great work. I don't love the new broadcast location. Uh, Reach us. On Twitter, at underscore Chris Pope. I'm at Farwell underscore OHL. Uh, Farwell and Pope at gmail.com is the email address. Send us ideas. Send us feedback. Subscribe, like, review. All of those great things wherever you're finding this podcast. And oh, of, co- and of course, OHL go stories. To, yeah. Yeah. Go to YouTube. Go to our YouTube page. Tons of content on there. We have all of our podcasts we've done. The videos are up there. But we've also done a couple other things Friday or Farwell's doing a thing on Fridays, Fridays with Farwell. I'm doing coffee reviews on the road. Just did one at Tallulah Cafe down in Windsor. We did the old rock up in Sudbury. Um, let us know what you're looking for, Farwell and Pope at gmail.com. But we talked a lot about Don Cameron in this podcast intro, and he always was extremely proud of where he came from, the summer side of PEI. That would be summer side PEI, the head coach of their junior A team, a former Peterborough Pete a former Kitchener Ranger, played some semi-pro hockey. Does this guy ever have some stories? And I beg you, I beg you. Stay to the end. Stay to the end. Oh, the very end. I'm so oh. mad at Billy oh, for good. keeping this story <laughs> for that long. We talked to him for an hour. I don't know how he didn't just say, guys, don't ask me the first question. I got a story for you. But without further ado, Billy McGuigan. The first thing I I wanted to know, Billy, because I think it took me about three tries to coordinate the proper time on this, because I couldn't figure out you're there in PEI. If it's if it's six o'clock Eastern time, what time is it there? Is that like a test that you might have for recruits to the uh, Summerside Caps? If if they can't figure this out, they're fourth liners forever. Is that how it would work for me? Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, the old Eastern thing. Right. So we don't uh, we don't worry too much about time out here. We're pretty, pretty laid back. <laughs> I, uh, how did you end up playing for Peterborough? How did I end up for Peter playing with Peterborough? Great story. So I was drafted by the Windsor Spitfires and uh, obviously didn't make it and went to training camp there. A year later, I played junior A in, some, in Charlottetown PEI with Forby Kennedy, who was my head coach, and uh, lots of great, uh, great battles with Forby and the Kennedys. Um, and then, uh, I was a 19 year old playing out East as an 18 year old and the, not my 19 year old season was coming up. Shane Turner was a scout for, uh, for the Peterborough Pete's at the time. And, and Shane was, Shane's an Islander scouts now for the Dallas stars played a big part in Justin Earl being drafted in the third round of uh, it's seven o'clock at the NHL uh, draft this year. Um, so Shane, Shane was kind of watching me. Shane got me a, basically a free agent tryout with the Peterborough Pete's. I went to training camp, um, Played four exhibition games in training camp. There was no back then. There was no uh, Jeff Tui had a rule that there was no fighting in training camp. So I made it through training camp, and then uh, once we got into the preseason, I played four preseason games, had four four uh, battles, and they were pretty good ones. And then uh, Jeff Tui brought me into the office and and uh, told me they were going to keep me. I'd broken my hand in the fourth one, or maybe the third one. But anyway, uh, nonetheless, Jeff Tui brought me into the office and told me they really liked me and they were real excited to have me on the team, and they. They wanted to sign me then, so I foregoed the rest of the preseason games and got to, uh, you know, got to sign a, a, a deal with the Peterborough Peets. And you know, initially it was Shane Turner the contact, and then uh, between Shane and Jeff, they they wanted a maritime guy, and and uh, I guess I was the fit for them at that time. And I'm grateful for it. I probably wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing now in hockey if it wasn't for Shane Turner and Jeff Tui. And to this day, they still mentor me. So it's uh, they always get calls or. or checking in with me or, or whatever the case might be. But uh, those guys have been a big, big impact in my life. And, and uh, they're just both fine gentlemen. And that's, you know, you try to take a little bit from that, that aspect of their lives. They're, they're both just fine gentlemen, great people, great family men, and, and uh, you know, great hockey guys. So it's always nice to have those guys close by. After not being successful with Windsor, how tough was it really to come back into the Ontario Hockey League and give it another kick at the can when the Peterborough Peach came a calling? Yeah, I think at that time in my life, it was uh, so back then for maritime kids. Now it's changed dramatically back then. I think there was four of us uh, basically playing major junior hockey. There was, you know, myself, David Ling, Todd McDonald at the time. And 
And I think uh, uh, Jason McDonald was in the OHL as well. So there's like four of us, maybe five. I think Corey Cooper came a year or two later, but and, and Brody Coffin. But those uh, those were the numbers back then for PEI guys playing. Now you see the Maritimes. There was no no Maritime teams at that time. So there was no Mooseheads, no Bathers, no Cape Breton. So it was a lot harder at that time. But you got to pick where you where you wanted to go, um, what league you wanted to go in. And, uh, you know, all the island guys, or a lot of them seem to like to go to the, the OHL. The OHL was a great league and kind of one of the premier leagues and the franchises were awesome. And so, um, you know, for me going back to junior A, it was hard, but my destination or my life or my, you know, hurt wanted to be in the OHL and I was going to do whatever it took to get there. And then whether that meant to go to Peterborough and, you know, as a free agent at 19 years old and fight my way under the team, that's what I was going to do. And that's, you know, essentially what I did, but if it wasn't for like a guy like Shane Turner to give a 19 year old rookie an opportunity and then Jeff Tui to sign a 19 year old rookie at a junior A and PEI, um, you know, that would have been a little bit devastating. But at the time, um, the OHL is where I want to be. Junior A and PEI was awesome. Maritime Hockey League was great back then as well. But essentially, I want to play major junior hockey. And really, the only stop for Islanders was, you know, in the OHL, it was hard to get into the Quebec League with, with the language barrier and out west was pretty far away. So the OHL was really the, the league you wanted to be in. You had a head coach up there. We've had him on the podcast, Dave McQueen. What was yes. your relationship like with uh, big Dave McQueen? Yeah, like I said, I only played 14 games there in Peterborough before I was traded to uh, the Kitchener. But I, I love Dave McQueen. He was, a, you know, an old school guy. I mean, we had some great players there. You know, Steve Webb, uh, Jamie Langenbrunner, Matt Johnson was on that team. I had a good friend, Jonathan Murphy, who's now a scout for Cape Breton for PEI. We traveled together with the, the famous David Ling. Um, we dropped him off in Kingston on the way by. But, uh, yeah, it was Dave was a great guy, great old school guy. You know, he gave you gave you opportunity. He gave you lots of respect. And if you did your job, you were, you know, on, on his good side for sure. With what you went through, Billy, to get into the Ontario Hockey League and, you know, the travel <laughs> being a huge part of it, obviously, coming from the Maritimes into the O. 14 games with the Peets and they say off to Kitchener kid. What's that? What's going through your head at that point? Well, at that time, to be totally honest, I remember, I remember the day, uh, you know, I was really good friends with Jonathan Murphy He's from Prince Edward Island um, was with the Peterborough Peets was a first round draft pick to the Peets. Um, you know, I became good friends with a lot of guys in the team. Chad Lang um, was a good friend of mine at the time. I mean, Jamie Langenbrunner, all those guys, cameraman I lived with. So a, a really good group of guys and, and, you know, had great bonds with those guys. When it came, it was pretty devastating for me. You know, obviously getting to the OHL and making it was, uh, was a task in its own. And, and then to have the call, um, you're going to be traded to the, the Kitchener Rangers. And essentially, I was a throw-in in the deal. It was, uh, it was Rick Emmett, um, Ryan Pollock type trade. And I think I was the extra guy that Kitchener was looking for a guy to go in and, and kind of drop the mitts a bit and, you know, get into the dirty work and, and they seen me as a guy maybe that was valuable to them and Peter Moore didn't seem as much value. So, so they, they uh, you know, they let me go in that trade and it was, uh, you know, probably was the best thing that happened to me as far as my career goes. I mean, I got to Peter or got to Kitchener and uh, uh, a day later uh, coach there, uh, McDonald was fired and uh, Jeff Ward came in and obviously Jeff Ward's an unbelievable coach and, and person. And uh, you know, I got to play under him for the, for that season. And, you know, it, it was hard to leave Peterborough, but I think, you know, looking back on the situation, looking back on the, the trade, I remember crying to John and the Murphy, bawling my eyes out, having to leave like Peterborough and going to Kitchener. But when I got there, I got a real good opportunity to play and I got a real op opportunity to show that I could play in the league. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, created great bonds when you get traded. It's a real hard couple of days, couple of weeks, but usually when you get into another team, you start growing those friendships again. And basically at the end of the day, the more teams you play on, the more friends you have at the end of it. So it, uh, it helps as a coach, that's for sure. All right, Billy, you've talked about the Maritimes and you mentioned David Ling. Everyone knows people from the Maritimes are these happy-go-lucky, really kind, just everybody wants to be around them. You and David Ling had that tough side to you. Where the, where the heck does that come from? You guys are such nice people. And then you put a you know, <laughs> pair of skates on and all of a sudden you guys want to beat everyone up. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the time, a lot of guys back in our era anyway, it was uh, the, the Kennedy era. It was uh, Forby Kennedy, um, Gerard Glant, um, those types of guys here in the Maritimes that really, you know, instilled that gritty island Maritime to you. We had coaches that you played against in the Maritime Hockey League, like Bill Riley, 
um, Jim Bottomley. They're legends in the Maritime Hockey League, but Bill Riley was an NHLer, um, you know, tough guy. Forby Kenny was an NHLer, a tough guy in the original six. Like, th this was a league back in the Maritimes, um, back in the 90s and, and 80s, that was extremely tough. That, uh, you know, anywhere you went, if you went to the Antigonish, Nova Scotia on a Saturday night, there was more than hockey going on there. It was usually a slugfest first and then hockey later. So, um, you know, there, there's been lots of real tough Maritimers. Obviously, Darcy Harris played in Kitchener. Um, one of the toughest Maritimers ever. Islander as well. Actually, cousin of my wife. So so that's a little bit of history there. I wore number 14 in, in Kitchener. He came in after me, wore number 14. I think he was the better of the two 14s and the tougher probably. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of tell him I paved the way for him. But, uh, you know, you had guys like Blaine Fitzpatrick in the OHL, Brody Coffin, David Ling. Jason McDonald, just to name a few guys, but all legit heavyweights and all, all had that fire in the belly. Mar Maritime guys are, are, like you said, happy-go-lucky. I think we have uh, uh, laid-back personalities for the most part, but uh, when push comes to shove, we're, we're, we're there in the battle, and I think that's just kind of the breeding in the Maritimes and how people out here are. As far as Close. I can, just real quick, because sure. it's a perfect follow-up here. In doing research for this interview, I got a text message and it said, ask him which Islander and former Ranger number 14 was a bigger fan favorite. Well, I don't Darcy, know who that Darcy, came from, but Hey, Darcy Harris all day long, <laughs> only because he played a few extra years, probably scored more goals than me too. So, <laughs> okay. I'll take second to Darcy any day, but let's, since we're on the subject and, and you're, I think your, your humility is showing through here, Billy, because you were no slouch when it comes to the ability to mix it up. True or false, DJ Smith and Ed Jovanovsky in the same game. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I did have that night. And DJ Smith, obviously, but both guys monsters. I mean, I'm standing at 5'11". Some of my friends would say I'm more like 5'10". But at that, that time, I was probably, you know, 185, 195 pounds. And, I, you know, you look across in Windsor at two guys, 6'4", 240. I don't know how heavy they were at that time in their lives, but they're big, big men. Um yeah, I had a scuffle with DJ Smith, and it was, uh, you know, a real good battle right around the blue line in Windsor. I remember it. Um, I actually spoke to DJ a couple of years ago in, at the OHL. Um, actually, the Memorial Cup in Kitchener went back there, and I ran into him out in the town one night, and we had a kind of discussion, but he remembered it. I remember it. Anyway, I had a, had a good battle with him, and then uh, later on, Eddie, Eddie wanted to – I think he wanted to beat me up next. So then uh, we got talking off a of face-off, and – and, uh, you know, he told me he was going to, you know, he's coming after me. So I basically sho shoved him off, said, no, no, I'm good. I'm not fighting again. And then as soon as the puck dropped, I kind of side, side swiped him, blinded him and kind of went after him. And he got one, he got one in early and it was a pretty hard one. So I basically held on after that and made sure he didn't hit me with another one. <laughs> so, yeah, I had two uh, battles with those, those guys. And I mean, that was just part of the game back then. It was, uh, you know, you did what you had to do. You stuck up for your teammates and, and, you know, every night was a battle and that's, uh, you know, that's what you kind of had to do to survive back then. I mean, I, I love that part of the game. I think it's, you know, it's, it's kind of out of the game now. I like the game a lot better probably now than it, than in the past, but uh, those were always the fun days. And I remember each and every one of those battles. It was a lot of, a lot of fun back then, but uh, the game's changed, I think for the better. Jovo uh, isn't small. Was he no. one of the, was he one of the tougher guys that you fought? Oh, I would say, I mean, you know, you know, at 19 year old, 19 years old and you, you come up against the guy like Jovo, he was, he was a monster. Like he was a big guy. Like I just did all I could to just to basically hang on to him. So he didn't knock me out. And, and I did get a, I was holding on to him and I remember him yelling at me that, you know, let me go, let me go. And then I kind of jam with a little quick one and hit him with one. And then he'd get madder and mad. he was getting madder as it went on, but I just hold on and hit him with one, hold on, hit him with one. Anyway, uh, funny story after, after, uh, after I fought with him, they were in the, the OHL all-star game had been in Kitchener. So Linger was on that OHL team. Uh, like I think it was the Don Cherry Bobby Orr game or one of those games in Kitchener. So I went over after the game to see Linger and Jovanovski was on that team and the boys were, get in the shower or whatever. And Joe Vanoss came out of the dress, out of the shower. And he kind of looked at me and we're chatting. And he goes, you're the guy that we were fighting last week in Windsor. And I said, I said, yeah, I started with that. And I said, you don't mind if I take one of your sticks to you. So, <laughs> so I ended up, I ended up going in the locker room and taking one of Joe Vanoss's sticks while I was waiting to have a chat with Linger. So it was, I still got it today. So it was a pretty classic moment there. What was life in hockey like for you, Billy? after the Ontario Hockey League. You had some pretty interesting stops there in pro. I did. I did. Oh, I mean, it was like, you know, I went to an NHL training camp in Colorado. Um, you know, again, it was, uh, 
you know, situation where someone had liked me. Uh, um, I think it was Dave Draper at the time was a scout, um, gave me a call, asked me, I was interested in going to training camp and I, and I was, and I wanted to go. So, so I ended up, uh, I ended up going to training camp in Colorado and, and, uh, there was a team back then, uh, PEI senators were here in the Island and I'd been talking to them, uh, a bit too. And they were kind of wanting me to stay around the Island and, and uh, give them a shot, but I wanted to get to an NHL training camp, and I couldn't get to Ottawa's. They wouldn't send me to Ottawa, so I ended up going to Colorado's camp. And again, it was one of those situations where you get in there, you know, you're around all these NHL guys, you get the mitts off, and 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 you're you're playing in those uh, those inter squad games, and then some preseason games, and you know, you 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 do what you got to do. But then, as my career went on, from there, I went uh, I went down to the Colonial Hockey League for another Islander. Dave Cameron was the coach in Detroit. Um, my career kind of, you know, for what, a, what it was, it was, uh, a pretty average, average career at best. So some time in the minors got traded from Detroit, went to Saginaw, played that season in Saginaw. And then the next year I went to Alaska gold Kings. Um, I wish I could take that year back. It wasn't much fun up in Alaska and we weren't a very good team. Um, and then I spent two years in Boise, Idaho, which I absolutely loved. I loved the city, loved the people of Idaho. I've been back there since for a reunion about five years ago. Just absolutely loved it. Fantastic rink. The place was packed. It was just, it was, you know, a dream come true. You play, you play minor pro hockey in like Alaska being so far away. We always flew. When I got to Boise, Idaho, we were always on a plane. We never, I never bossed three years. I played minor pro hockey in Alaska and Boise, Idaho. I never took a bus. It was always by plane. So it was uh, a minor league uh, destination, but you know, you got the, professional NHL vibe to it when you got to fly everywhere and, you know, visit some great cities, San Diego, Bakersfield, all through California, Tucson had a team in, in Arizona there at the time, Phoenix had a team one year there. So there's been, you know, a lot of great cities, a lot of, a lot of cool experiences, but like I said, I had an average minor league career and bounced around a bit. And then when it was over, it was, it was over. Essentially I was ready to hang them up, but I didn't see the, I didn't see the dream of playing the NHL part of it anymore. So it was time to time to move on. You mentioned your stop in Saginaw. You look at that roster, there's quite a few guys with over 100 penalty minutes. I'm sure there were some wild games as a Saginaw wheel. Do you remember anyone specifically? There was some wild games in Saginaw. Um, not really in, in specifically, uh, but, uh, you know, I remember uh, I remember Jesse Austin fighting uh, Jacques Mayotte in Saginaw. It was a, it was an unbelievable fight. Um, you know, two heavyweights. I fought Dan DuPont there in, in Saginaw. They played with Thunder Bay. The scariest part of the Colonial League was always going up to Thunder Bay when they had Bruce Ramsey, Mel Engelstad, Vern Ray. Like, oh my God, it was like something out of slap shot when you're, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. Um, you know, back then playing with the Saginaw Wheels. Like, you know, it's you're, you're down in the minors at this point, and you're you're looking across the bench, going, oh my God, how do I get back to PEI from here? So, you know, it was uh, it was a unique experience. But it was a tough, tough league back then. And it was, uh, you know, every night you had to be on your toes. I was a good teammate of, of Steve Webbs. And Steve and I ended up fighting later on. And, you know, he played with Muskegon in that, in that league before he went on to the NHL. I fought Garrett Burnett in that league before he went on to the NHL. You know, there's just a number of guys that were real tough. And it was a real, real tough league. It was a, interesting characters. But, uh, you know, you speak to a lot of them now. And they're awesome guys. And, you know, we've created lots of great friendships with some of the guys that I used to tangle with. And it's, uh, it's just part of that hockey bond. You mentioned that opportunity at an NHL camp, which was with the Colorado avalanche. And that was not just a, your run of the mill NHL club at the time. You've got Sackick, you've got Forsberg, Adam Deadmarsh. I know a guy that you really admired or part of that club. When you're walking into that room, into that camp, what's going through your head? I'm a, I'm a kid from what's going through my head is I'm a kid from PEI. How cool is this? I don't even know. I don't even know at the time if I even thought about making the team, it was more like, Holy shit, I'm going to an NHL training camp. It's Colorado. Wendell Clark growing up was my favorite player. So, so Wendell Clark was part of that team in that year. He wasn't in training camp at the time. Um, so the best thing that happened to me at that training camp is, is uh, when we were going in to get our sticks and they were getting us fitted for sticks or whatever the, you know, you put your order in and they take your stick, your curve and all this. Wendell Clark was not a training camp at the time, but it all sticks were there. So I just told the trainer, I said, do you mind if I take Wendell Clark sticks? I didn't, they weren't the right curve for me. I didn't even like the flex in them or anything like that, but I took all Wendell Clark sticks. So I, I made sure that I saved one, uh, you know, as part of, part of that life experience. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was just overwhelming experience. I remember the first practice 
getting on the ice with Dead Marsh, Mike Ricci, like you said, Forsberg, Joe Sackick. They won the Stanley Cup that same year. So it was uh, the end of the day. I stayed with a guy named Eric Messier. We were kind of in the same situation. He was a defenseman. I was a forward. We were both kind of kept in training camp longer than some of the other guys. We were sent to the minors at the same time. And he ended up making making the NHL and playing, I think, for 10 years. Won a Stanley Cup there in Colorado, maybe two. But, uh, yeah, we were in the same boat. He was a free agent coming from college. I was a free agent coming from junior. And we were battling for the same kind of position, hardworking guys that are trying to, you know, fill a role, whether the fourth line or he's a bottom set, bottom pair of D. And, and uh, they ended up keeping him. Eric ended up playing, I think, some forward for Colorado in the rest of his career. But he ended up winning the Stanley Cup and, and – uh, you know, so I guess he was the lucky one on that occasion. Did you ever look back and think how close you were? I, I do. I have. And, and uh, you, you know, you, you kind of scratch yourself and say, geez, I wish I could have done things differently. And you, now as a coach, you see kids kind of going through the same, same adversity or the same thing. You, you know, you wish, looking back on the life's great experiences and you look back on it and say, geez, I wish I had been in better shape, like maybe had a better summer, better – better year, you know, whatever the case is, there's always some regrets when you get that close. And I think, uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of the fact that I got to an NHL training camp. Not a lot of people get to do that. Um, to have a little bit of a minor league career, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, um, you know, I, it was all on hard work and, and, uh, you know, I come from a hard working family. So all that kind of stuff kind of, you know, plays into things. So I'm real proud of my career, real proud of the chances I had real proud of the opportunities I had as a player, but uh, you do look back and, and say, geez, if I just had a tried a little harder that summer or did a little more, or, you know, maybe fought that one guy or maybe, you know, whatever, got a goal that night. Maybe, maybe I'm sitting here a millionaire, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned coaching, Billy, and that's obviously where you're at today and you've been doing it for so long. I think you've won every coaching award there is to win on the island right now, but I want to talk about one of the other experiences and that's the one that brought you into major junior again with a real proud franchise in the WHL, the Regina Pats. What, what led to that coaching assignment? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, first of all, first off, I'm pretty well, pretty well an Islander by heart, right? Like I want to be on PEI, I love PEI. So it's a, it's a hard, uh, it's a hard sell to get me off the island. I mean, if the Kitchener Rangers ever come calling, I mean, I, I guess that would be my dream job. I mean, I'll, my mom prints every island, I live in PEI. So there's a Charlottetown Islanders here as well, but the Summerside Capitals are a storied franchise and I love being here and I love coaching here. We've started a lot of, a lot of things here at PI hockey school, but back, back to, uh, you know, 2013, we won a Royal bank cup. Um, you know, I was in discussions with a couple of major junior teams. I've had lots of opportunities to go to major junior jobs as assistant coach over the years. Um, and, and, uh, this, the, the Regina job, a friend of mine, Malcolm Cameron was a, was a coach at the time. Um, the head coach there was named head coach. He's a maritime guy. Um, called me, asked me if I was interested. I was talking to two or three teams at the time, and and I had a, a cousin. Her, her name's Karen Voss, and and she was living out there and and in Regina. And uh, you know, my wife was on maternity leave, and we had an opportunity there that she wasn't working at the time that we could, you know, maybe take a run at it and see what it was like, and you know, have uh, have a chance to go to a major junior. And the next part of that was the Regina Pats or the most storied franchise in the history of major junior hockey. And, and I always said, if I didn't take that opportunity at that time to coach the Regina Pats in the WHL, I think that would have been one that I would never be able to get over. So, um, you know, you just start looking at the history of the team, the NHL players that, that uh, played there, the, the community, Saskatchewan has, Oh my God, a number of NHL players. They're everywhere. Um, so that was really the, the driving force behind it, having a friend as the coach that was from the Maritime. So having another Maritimer was pretty key. Um, the ability for my family to move at that time was key. Having a family member there was key. And then, uh, you know, the storied history of the Regina Pats. It was, uh, you know, an unbelievable experience. We went there. I went there as assistant coach, ran the defense, um, became real good friends with Josh Dixon, who was the other assistant coach there. Um, we were picked to finish last in the league. Um, in, in the, uh, the pundits start up to the season where they kind of give ratings on teams and we were picked finished last and the, the Pats haven't won a division in a while. And, and, uh, we ended up winning the division, the East division in the WHL. So it was, uh, it was an outstanding, you know, situation to be in. We, we, we obviously got bumped in the playoffs, but just to have a regular season like we did. And there's a banner hanging East division champs, 2013 Regina Pats that, 
that, you know, I feel privileged that I had the opportunity to, to help raise. So it was, uh, it was a great experience. I had another year in my contract left there. I was dealing with some issues back at home with my, my father at the time was really sick. God willing, he's made it through, uh, some battles with cancer and he, and he's, uh, you know, still here with us, but uh, at that time it didn't look good. And, and, um, uh, you know, we were, we spent our year in Regina and it was, uh, it was one that uh, was a great experience, but it was, it was time for us to go back home. And so I left my contract on the table there in Regina and come back and, uh, you know, I wasn't coaching at the time, but then I ended up getting back with Summerside Capitals. I've been here ever since. And I love it here in Summerside and I love coaching the Capitals. And, you know, there's always, always that itch to want to take another shot at it and, you know, the right time, the right place and, and the right phone call, you know, I would, would definitely look at it down the road, but right now I'm pretty happy where I'm at. Real quick, Chris, excuse me for a sec, but just to follow up off the ice, uh, and I know Alaska, we already mentioned, Boise, Idaho, but as an Islander, what are the Canadian prairies looking like to you at the time? Pretty, pretty flat, pretty flat, <laughs> pr- pretty cold. No, it was uh, like, I, I liked, I liked the West. It was, uh, it was a great, great, uh, great spot, great opportunity. And it was, it's a nice place. People are nice. They're a lot like Maritimers, people from out West they are nice people. They, you know, they take care of you. They can't do enough for you. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a bigger version of, of people from the Maritimes. I think, I think, you know, they're for the most part, they're real humble, real nice people. And, you know, I fit in well there and I really liked it. You mentioned Summerside. Um, it's, uh, everyone knows about the Capitals. It's been around forever. Uh, the coaches, the coaches that have went through there, you mentioned Gerard Gallant, Turk coach there. Um, do you ever look around and realize the coaches that have come before you there? Absolutely. I do it almost every day. I mean, it's, uh, I'm lucky and fortunate. I think that's what kind of draws me to stay here in Summerside, you know, as a big part of it. It's, you know, I've, I've raised a family here. I have a 13 and 14 year old, two daughters, and I have a son that's eight. And we got a hockey school going here now in Summerside, Tenacity Hockey. And with the Gallant brothers, Alex and Brett Gallant, who play in the American Hockey League, and Eric Renzi, who's my goalie coach with the Capitals. We, we started a hockey school here. Um, so we're building a lot of things here as a family. And, and um, you know, I look, I look at, we have some pictures on our walls there, like Darren Langdon played here. Um, you know, good friend of mine, talked to quite a bit. Turk Glant was a co-chair. Grant Sonia brought the Stanley Cup into my office this year, won it with Tampa Bay as a scout last year. Um, you know, Doug McLean um, coached here. Um, Jim Clark, who's the, who's the head scout for the uh, Ottawa Senators, coached here. So j- just to name a few, Gordon Dwyer is now, former NHLer, is now coaching St. John Sea Dog. He coached here in Summerside. So, so the, the number of you know, professional hockey coaches that came through here is phenomenal. And, and uh, you know, I like the history. Like I said, when I went to Regina, it was a lot to do with the history. I'm a history buff myself, and I just love the fact that Summerside's such a historic franchise, and there's so much history here. And, and uh, you know, we're just looking to try to build on that history. And I love it here. I love coaching here. I got a great general manager, with Pat McKeever. Um, you know, I think as a one-two punch, we're, you know, as good as anyone in the game. And, and uh, you know, we work tirelessly to, to build our program, to get the kids to the next level. And it's, uh, you know, it's been pretty rewarding here at Summerside. So I love it here. And it's the history's on the wall. And, and uh, every now and then you scratch your head and go, can you imagine Gerard Glenn, he's coaching New York Rangers, has coached here at Summerside. So, you know, it's a pretty special place, that's for sure. Do you have a relationship with Turk at all? I do, yeah. And we, you know, talk from time to time. I'll send him a text or whatever. You know, we follow, obviously he follows the Capitals. All those guys do. You know, I'll talk to Doug McLean and Turk from time to time just by text or even by phone calls. You know, usually Turk will give me a call when we lose a few and, you know, torture me a bit that where was I this weekend or whatever, you know. His co- his son coached with his last couple of years, uh, Jason Glant. Um, he moved on. He took a head coaching job at the Major Midget Program here, but Turk's son was here with us for two years. Um, yeah, so I have great relationships with all those guys and, and you know, they're, they're a phone call or text away, you know, if I ever need a question or if I ever want to talk hockey, you know, they're great people, they're great mentors and they're great Islanders. So, you know, they're just like anyone else. If you want to talk hockey, they love it and they'll talk hockey. Farzi, I just had to ask that just because I feel like everybody from out there has a relationship with Turk. Like I imagine him being like, what's the guy's name from great big C who just walks around like nothing. Alan Doyle, I imagine, sure. Yeah. I imagine yeah. just Turk just walking around. Everyone's like, there's Gerard Gallant. <laughs> Well, yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. He's, he's certainly the most well-known probably Islander here for sure. And, and uh, again, just like, you know, when you, when I talk with Shane Turner, Jeff Tui, guys like that, like just such humble people like Gerard Glant is, you know, as humble as you would ever, you know, ever meet. He's a super guy. He's, 
you know, always gives time to everyone. You know, he drive he drives around Summerside here and, you know, when he's, when he's off time, he'll take a spin around the community and just drive his car around. He'll play cards on Friday night with his buddies that he had for, you know, 50 years. Like there, he's just one of the boys when he's here and, and uh, he's very well known, very well respected. It's, it's pretty special to have a guy like him around. Well, it's funny. We're talking about these relationships of fellow Islanders and, I know we go back a few years here, Billy, with the, the stories of your time in, in major junior, and it was only a part of a season in Kitchener, but I can't think of Summerside without thinking of the late great play-by-play voice of the Kitchener Rangers and Don Cameron. He always said he was from the Summerside of the Island. That's how he described Summerside. But do you, uh, did you have any relationship with Don in your short time in Kitchener? I did. I had a very good relationship with Don, um, you know, that, that extended from the time I played right up to the time he, he passed. Um, I had lots of conversations with him, even, you know, years later, I, you know, tracked down a number or he tracked down me and we'd have a, just a chat on the phone and, and talk. And, you know, when I was back there, the first place I went when I went back to Kitchener, the Morrow Cup year there, I think it was 2003, somewhere around there when they hosted. Anyway, I was back for the Memorial Cup and to see some of my old buddies, Dave Blitzke and, and Dylan Seek and some of those guys. And we were, hanging out but the first stop I made that night was right up to the gondola there up to see Don so it's uh it, I mean it, when you're from Prince Edward Island I don't know how to explain it best but when you leave Prince Edward Island and you see someone from Prince Edward Island somewhere else it's like immediate bond it's immediate conversation it's you, you almost look look for that uh island banter and and uh you know you want to you know always make that connection uh, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're at Regina and you meet someone that works in the oil field and they come up and say, Hey, you're really big and you coach Regina Pats. I work. Oh, well, we have an hour conversation about the Island. Like it's, it's one of those things. It's a small little province here. And when you see someone from home, it's always pretty special, no matter, no matter where you're at. You mentioned people from out there. I can't read Gerard Gallant's name without hearing it in Darcy Harris's voice. I just love the way <laughs> Islanders say his name anyway. Um, Another former Islander, if we can get personal here for a second, told me to ask you about the night before your wedding. What happened uh, the night before your wedding? L- listen, those those guys, some of these, David Lane's lucky I don't tell all the stories <laughs> right now. So, and I will tell this story. It is a pretty, pretty, pretty good story, I guess. So, I was in David's wedding. He was in, he was in mine there back, you know, many years ago. But, uh, so we went to O'Leary PEI where Darcy Harris is from. So, the night before I said, uh, Tammy's my wife's Tammy McGuigan there Tammy Smallman at the time was uh we, we decided to get a couple campers and we stayed at Mill River Resort so my guys that were in my wedding there was six or seven of us all you know hockey guys Brody Coffin uh Trevor Burr is a scout for the Islanders Brody Coffin you know played uh, OHL hockey played pro hockey um real good guys and, and we decided that uh that we would go out uh, to Mill River for the night and you know as the night went on we boys want to have a few beer, right? Like it's, it's one of those things you want to you want to have a cup of beer when you're with the boys. So it's the night before my wedding, my wedding's at one o'clock PM on, on the next day on the Saturday. So as the night goes on, we decide, okay, let's take a walk down to this little bar that's down the road. And, and uh, so we did, and I guess it was, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning by the time we got back to the campers and, you know, I'm getting married the next day. So I'm trying hard to, you know, get to sleep and this is coming on. 5 36 o'clock and I'm like boys like come on like I gotta get married tomorrow like we gotta get this thing straightened out like I haven't slept yet <clears throat> so from there I decided to go uh we decided to get them up and go to breakfast because I was I was sober at the time like I was done like these guys were still kind of drinking and I couldn't get them to slow down I couldn't get them to stop so I was like this is gonna be a disaster so I said well let's go into the hotel and get some breakfast so I go into the hotel and they can't find Linger. So I'm like, where's Linger gone, boys? And they're just kind of laughing. I don't know. Like, where's Linger? And they're all still half gassed, right? So I'm, I got them down. I got them sitting down to eat breakfast. I'm like, okay, I'm going to check into my hotel room and get a couple hours sleep. So I go to the front desk at the hotel room, Mill River, and I said, uh, hi, I'm Billy McGuigan. I'm the groom for, for the wedding at 1 o'clock today. I was wondering if there's any way I could check into my hotel. These guys are still drinking. I need to get some sleep. And they go, Billy McGuigan already checked in. I was like, what? So anyway, long story short, Linger went to the front desk about an hour before me, got my hotel room key, told him he was me and went, went to sleep in my room. 
So locked me out. Anyway, I get in a little later, but uh, that was the story of my, my wedding night. He's, he's quite a cat. I was also told to ask real quickly, Farzi, if I can follow this up. Was there something to do with your boxers the next day, the day of your wedding? Wow. Yeah, we'll keep that one off the, off okay. the air. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Okay. That's fair. But, but I'll, I'll try this one then because there might have been a time where, I don't know, you know, he wouldn't have been wearing them at the time. But it was a game. Uh, you, Linger, your parents in the crowd, and Linger decided to uh, to say hi in an unusual way. Yeah, so Linger's always up to no good, of course. And then uh, my parents come up, and I'm playing in a – I think it was a preseason game with Peter Pete. so I'm trying out for the team. So, first of all, he's going by the bench every time I get on the ice. He's telling Dave McQueen, what are you doing playing that guy? He can't skate. <laughs> so every – you know, this is my buddy from PEI. I'm trying to make the Peter Gore and he's, you know, ripping me apart to the guy that's trying to coach me. Anyway, so long story short, my parents are behind my bench, which back in the old Kingston rink, he's uh, he's like across the rink from the other, like the benches are across from each other. So my parents are sitting in the front row, kind of right behind our bench, and Linger's in the in the in the their benches across from us. So he's taking down his gear, like playing with his suspenders, and you know, taking down his pants to kind of pretend he's fixing his cup type thing over by his bench so my parents are across the ice and he's got their attention now I don't know how this happens but he's he has my parents attention and and uh so he's like pretending he's playing and he just drops his drawers and and gives them a, a nice big moon and pulls them back up and has a big laugh and out for the next shift and probably scores one or two and and the game goes on but that's uh that was his little hello to my parents in my preseason game in, in the OHL he told me that he used to call your parents at like three in the morning just to see how they were doing <laughs> all the time, all the time for many, 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 many years. Why? <laughs> yeah, just to check in four o'clock in the morning, having a few drinks. How's, how's, how's your, how's your parents doing? Yeah, no, it was, uh, yeah, it was fun growing up. We had a great, great group of friends. This might be your chance to get back at them. You want to, uh, give us any, uh, linger dirt after oh you brought God. up some had, of those stories i i if we had four hours on here and it was uh x-rated we could go on for hours we better not let's let's get back onto the ice and, and your time as a coach because uh when when we first connected billy it's because you had uh, a couple of i i think what the term we used we and, and it, i don't think it's far off <laughs> frankly is uh some some kitchen ranger royal bloodlines out there playing for you in summerside in Nathan Torquia, son of Mike, and, and Justin Ertl, son of Tyler, who I believe it would have been Tyler's dad, Bob, who was the general manager in Kitchener when you first arrived there. So these guys, it's a pretty small world, isn't it? It's an absolutely small world. We were talking before the show. It's, it's uh, you know, the hockey world is such a small place. And like I said, an average, average uh, minor league hockey career turned into, you know, a n- number of teams. But every team you went to, you made a new friend. And, and uh, you know, usually a group of them – so contacts are kind of endless at the end of the day. And a lot of guys kind of stay in hockey and it's, uh, it's kind of how it is. And Bob Ertle was the GM of the Kitchener Rangers and Tyler was playing hockey at UPEI at the time. And like I said, I'd come home in the summer and I'd see the university guys and I'd skate with them sometimes and I'd hang out with Tyler and, and some of the UPEI Panthers. And then again, when I came back at the end of the season or in the summer, they'd be around. So I'd end up hanging out with those guys. They're all hockey guys. They're all playing at UPEI and, and we, we became good friends. And then years later, Tyler started a hockey school, obviously in, in Kitchener there and holistic hockey, and he's doing awesome. And I had started one about five years ago and we'd, you know, contact each other back and forth and talk about, you know, I'd ask him what he's doing for his D camp or, you know, having a chat with him about different stuff. And, and then, uh, you know, never really get into trying to get his son here. I knew he had a son that was a good player. Um, just, you know, our relationship wasn't that type of relationship. I didn't want to start asking like, send your kid out to the Maritimes here for me. He's doing pretty good where he was at SAC. Um, and then COVID hit. And then once COVID hit, it was, you know, and it's, the world even got smaller then. Like, you know, we talked about Torquia and, and uh, you know, former Kitchener Ranger, legendary Kitchener Ranger. I knew his name when I went to Kitchener, that's for sure. And, and Tyler and his father, Bob, all those relationships kind of came together. And then, uh, you know, we uh, we ended up having Tyler's son, Justin, live with us, live with us here at the house. And, and uh, became a big part of our family. <clears throat> my son Clark, absolutely. My son's eight years old. Absolutely unbelievable relationship he had with Justin. He loves. He loved Justin. My girls were the same. It was uh, my wife was the same. Justin got whatever 
whatever kind of he wanted around here, I became second fiddle. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's those relationships that you, that you build and that, that you, you know, it might be 20 years after the fact, but one phone call and you're back, you know, you see your buddies at, <clears throat> at an establishment 20 years later and you sit down and have an hour conversation with them, have a really good chat. And that's kind of how Tyler and I's relationship was. We hadn't seen each other for a while, but, you know, when we got back chatting again, we, you know, we're back talking old times and, you know, now we're in a couple chat groups with some of the old UPI pants, some of the guys we travel with and yeah, lots of banter every day back and forth on that. So it became, you know, a real good relationship. Justin had a great year here. Um, Shane Turner, big influence in my life and my hockey career, you know, scouted him, watched him, you know, a lot, watched our practices, um, you know, ended up getting selected in the third round with the Dallas Stars as a Summerside Western Capital. So from what Tyler Riddle's father did for me, bringing me to the Kitchener Rangers and giving me that opportunity. And for us, an organization here at the Summerside Capitals, bringing his son in and, and giving him the opportunity here to play in Summerside during a COVID and getting drafted in the third round. I think it kind of, everything kind of went full circle with the family and it was just, you know, real special to hear his name being drafted as a Summerside Western Capital. Tyler was the one who told Farzi and I that, you know, you played a big part in his son being drafted and for his father to trade for you. And then for you to play a big part in his son getting drafted, like that's one of the best stories we've heard on this podcast, just how the hockey community continues to help each other. Yeah, no, I agree. I think like, I think the hockey community is a very, very special place. And it's, uh, you know, you, you just, you create these relationships and these bonds and, everyone's after the same thing. You, you know, you want to be involved in hockey. You want to get better at hockey. You want to be a better coach. You want to be a better player. You want to, you know, develop relationships that you can call guys and get information or share information. And it's just a real special community. And it's, it's a very small community. It's, it's, um, it's hard to describe to someone that's not on the inside and that doesn't really know, you know, how hockey works and how, how small of a community it is. Like, I went to the NHL draft two years ago. We had a player, his name is Jordan Spence, that played in Summerside, was undrafted in the Quebec League, played with us as a 16-year-old. So he was not drafted to Major Junior. He played a season with us. So the following year, he was drafted to the Moncton Wildcats as a 17-year-old, played with the Moncton Wildcats, was an all-star defenseman, was drafted in the fourth round by the LA Kings the very next year. So his father and myself were really good friends growing up, and, and uh, we had a special bond as – just hockey friends and buddies. We played against each other. We were always friends with exact same age. So when he got drafted, I had the opportunity to, you know, go out to BC, out to Vancouver and, and watch the kid be drafted to the NHL. So it, it, it was a friendship that, you know, developed over 40 years of, of uh, you know, of hockey with his father. And then just to have the opportunity to see his son being drafted to the NHL that, you know, essentially came through the Summerside Capitals program. Me as the coach was just, you know, it's, it's hard to describe in words how, how great a feeling that is. After all these years in the game, Billy, and all these years coaching, we, we talk about a couple of guys, Justin Spence, Tyler, uh, sorry, Justin Ertl, these guys going to the NHL that played for you. Is there something that you see in a player where you're like, this is the guy I'm going to push, lean on a little bit more because I think he's got whatever that might be? Yeah, I think there's, I think there is definitely, I think there's a little bit of an it factor and you see some special kids, but a lot of times for me, it's, just, it's, it's their, it's their attitude or their, their demeanor, you know, that you really notice, like <clears throat> both of those kids that we talk about um, were just really driven kids. Like, like just, Justin Ertl was, was here and Justin Ertl was going to, going to get drafted to the NHL. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's the way he, he was going. He was here to prepare to, to get drafted to the NHL. Um, and, and that's how he, he spent every day. And, and, and Jordan Spence was the exact same way. They're, they're kids that, um, you know, just are driven. And you, you can see it in them. You see it early on. I remember having a conversation with Jordan Spence um, in training camp here in Summerside where I kind of had the conversation, Jordan, you're 16. You're a little bit undersized at the time. He's, he's growing quite a bit now. But at the time, like, you know, you're kind of want to be, you know, transparent with the family. I don't know if you're going to make our team, like what's your plan B? I don't have a plan B. I, I'm going to play with Summerside Capitals. And then from there, it's like, that's where you see the it factor, the demeanor of the kids, the attitude, how driven they are. And then that makes you kind of want to fight for them and work for them. And, you know, we've seen it in different players. Bennett MacArthur was another example. Played with us and not drafted the back league two years ago. Um, went to the Acadie Bathurst T10, 
halfway through our season was drafted or was a, a free agent invite to the, uh, to the NHL training camp this year with Phoenix Coyotes now plays in Bathers. He's a 20 year old, one of the top scorers in the Quebec league um, last year. So, I mean, it's, these guys are usually there's something about them that just kind of gives you the, the eye to see that they're, you know, they want it more than the most guys and will kind of do whatever it takes. So like, you know, if the guys are going out on a Saturday to kind of get together and then you have a guy like Justin Ertl that, that uh, decides to stay home and do a schoolwork and, and prepare for, you know, school the next day or the Monday or whatever, it's, those kids are special kids. And, and it's, uh, it takes, it takes a lot of, uh, take, takes a lot of uh, self, self-management and time management to do that. I got to fly here. It keeps coming on my screen <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So Justin would, would, would pass up opportunities sometimes, you know, maybe to, to hang it with the guys to get his schoolwork done. Cause he knew, you know, come Monday, it was back to a busy week of hockey and he wanted every second of hockey he could get. And, you know, those, those guys are special kids and, and not every kid can do that. Not every kid is, uh, not every kid is, uh, is built that way. And, and, you know, the special ones are, that fly just wants to be a fly on the wall for when you call David oh. Ling after and give him crap for some of the stories he told us. <laughs> yeah, um, we when in talking with Linger on, on this podcast and we talked with Darcy, those are two of the guys that I thought from the East coast that almost liked fighting. Were you a guy that enjoyed it? Or were you a guy that was going to the rink every day going, I don't know who or like player X. Oh, I'm going to have to fight him tonight. Yeah, I know. I, I was uh, early on in my career, like as a junior, I think I had that mentality that it was like anyone and everyone and all, all, all the time, anywhere, like kind of thing. But then uh, as you learn faster, as you get to pro um, <clears throat> and the guys are bigger, stronger and they're older and they're 30 years old and they're, you know, you're 20 and they're, you know, 220 pounds and you're 185 or 195 at the time. It's uh, it's uh you change your love for it. I think at times, uh, Dar Darcy Glant or Darcy Harris was a special breed. He, he's a, you know, he's a big, strong guy. He's, you know, comes from O'Leary PEI firm and community firm, farmer, farmer by trade for his family. He's a teacher, but, uh, you know, he grew up, you know, good old PEI farm boy. And, and, uh, you know, he had, a, he had another level of, of toughness that, uh, you know, not a lot of guys have and, and Linger on the flip side, Linger was, uh, Linger was a guy that would drop the gloves at any given moment, any given time with anyone because he was causing so much trouble on the ice that uh, he, he kind of had to do it. Um, so I don't know if I would say I liked it. I didn't hate it, but it wasn't something that I woke up in the morning excited to do. Obviously, obviously when you, when you're reading the program and you're, you're sitting in before a game, you see guys like Jock Mayotte or your Ed Jovanoski's or Aaron Downey's. I, I had a fight with in the Maritime Hockey League, guys like that, Steve Webb like these guys are, these guys are pretty, pretty tough guys and pretty able. So, you know, the, to have them, you know, coming after you, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's, you, you better be ready and the ner the nerves are always there. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I'd say I liked it. I didn't, didn't hate it, but you know, it was something that I think I had to do to, to stay in the game. You mentioned earlier, Billy, that you think the game is in a better place today than it was when fighting was so much more a part of it. And Chris and I, so many people in the game have had that conversation. But as a coach now, how do you how do you change that mindset? How have you evolved in the game to coach kids where that's not a part of it, where when you were playing, you might have approached a certain play a completely different way than you coach kids to approach the play now? Listen, a hundred percent. Like the, the game has changed dramatically as from a coaching perspective. I mean, you know, from a player's perspective back in the nineties, it was a totally different game. And, you know, do you, you get to it now where it's, you know, as a coach, uh, even when I got into coaching, even five, 10 years ago, you still had that intimidation factor. You still had that, you know, you could go out and, and, uh, you know, you might have, if you have the toughest player in your team, he can maybe go out and intimidate them or that that's kind of gone. I think that I think social media for me, and, you know, I'm just, this is just my opinion, but social media, I think for me has played a major factor in how kids, uh, how kids, um, you know, see opponents. Now it's like a lot of them know each other via social media. A lot of them go to the same development camps. You know, if it's, a, if they're maritime kids, you see development camps throughout the Maritimes. They probably attend one or played in some type of showcase with guys from other provinces and then they become friends. So <clears throat> when they get to junior, 
most guys, like, you know, you know, 80% of the guys in the other team and you're friends with them. So it just kind of became a thing where there's less fighting. The intimidation factor is kind of gone. Um, I say the game's in a better place as far as the skill level's outstanding. Um, the skill level nowadays and the game nowadays is so fast. The kids are so fast. They're so skilled. They do so much development work on their own in the summertime. Their their next level skill, like even junior A to major junior to major junior to the NHL, these kids are as skilled in junior A. They might not, you know, execute a play quite as quick as a top guy in the major junior, top guy in the NHL, but they're doing it at a pretty good clip and they're, uh, you know, they're managing the puck differently now. You hang on to the puck, you make plays, there's less contact. But uh, so that side of the game has really changed. But I really do feel there's still a place in hockey for for the odd good tussle. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that happen in games now where, you know, you might get a deliberate cheap shot or someone gets hit kind of dirty or, you know, the way things are kind of going. Like, you, you, you just got to be real careful on, on the, the situation you put yourself in. If you're a player, if you – you know, I don't like the stick work that's in the game now. I, I, I think uh, the refs can do a better job managing the game. Um, it, it's uh, it's certainly evolved as a, as a game, and I think there's still a place for hockey in it where I think if you do something cheap to a, to a guy in, on the other team, I think you should have to still pay the piper type deal to, to you know, to give, you know, police, police the game on your own. The, player, the players at the end of the day are essentially playing the game. There should be an opportunity for them. To, to police the game, to, to put another player on an opponent's team in check type, so to speak. And so to speak. And that's uh, something that I still think that that is offered in the game, but you don't see a lot of it. I, I often get a kick out of the kids that, uh, you know, you, there was a scrum in the corner and no one dropped their gloves, but three guys went to the penalty box and you're sitting in the dressing room after the game, kind of just overhearing the players talk. Did you see that fight? <laughs> like what fight? There was no fight there. They, they kind of, you know, look at, fighting now is like, you know, a good scrum in the corner where they, you know, they're punching each other with their gloves and helmets on type deal where, where my thoughts on a fight back when we were playing, it was like, yeah, there was a brawl. Everyone in the place had their gloves off. There was guys jumping you from the bench. Like it was, it was, it's totally different, but I think, I think it's cleaned up the game a lot. It's safer for the players. And, you know, I, I still would like to see a little bit more of that, you know, being able to pay the paper type deal, but I, I like the way the game's gone. And as a coach, totally different, totally different uh, mindset as a coach. Now, um, you know, I've evolved so much as a coach over the years, I think I had to, to, to stay in the game and to have success. Um, you know, I think there, the times that, you know, you know, getting on the kids yelling at them or, or, you know, trying to intimidate them is, is totally gone. It's, it's, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta build relationships. I've, I think I've, I've mastered the, I've mastered the, uh, the relationship type of building, I think, as a coach, I feel that, you know, I get the best out of my teams that I can get. I think, you know, I, I've done a good job evolving as a, as a person, as a coach. I think maturity and, you know, getting older, some of that happens um, automatically. But uh, I think you have to take a look in the mirror at some point and, you know, evolve as, as the game has. And, you know, you're always learning. There's never a chance that you're not learning. I learned, you know, I, my, my son plays – novice double a and my daughters play pete they and midget and you know yeah i go to a game and i see something in the game i might learn like you're a, listen to a coach from the novice team talk about a situation like it's it's just you're always learning there's always always ways to evolve and there's always ways to get better and and uh you know i i, I love coaching i love being here in summerside and and uh you know every day you, you work for a championship that's why we do it and every day's uh, every day's a new day and every day's an exciting day quick follow-up on that evolution maturity and watching the game sometimes you think maybe the referees aren't uh, managing the game the way you would like to see them manage it you ever been tossed i have not been tossed in quite a while in quite a while, quite a while. yeah quite a while but it's been a few years but yeah i've been tossed in the game but not for a long long time what'd you say no oh, i can't i don't know <laughs> I can't remember. It's a long time ago um, if we can go back to your playing days, you mentioned that time in Colorado, uh, the first inner squad game. Do you remember who you lined up against? I do. I, I lined up against Adam Dedmarsh and, and I think, all right, he might've been on my line. I lined up against Owen Nolan in, uh, in one of them. And I remember, I remember being pretty nervous and, you know, kind of saying something to him like, geez, like, you know, Hey, Hey, <laughs> the awkward, like, 
hey, how you doing? He kind of gave me a tap on the pads. He said, just play, kid. Like, you know, okay, sir. You know, it was, uh, yeah, no, I got to, I got to experience something, you know, something special there. And, like, there was Owen Nolan was there. And, uh, Dead Marsh and Ricci were, I think I played in a line with one of them and, or with those two guys in preseason in an exhibition game. Um, uh, for, uh, Corbet, Rene Corbet was there. Like, it was just, a, you know, a special time, and, you know, unbelievable team. And to see them go on and win a Stanley Cup was pretty, pretty amazing. Did you get to spend much time with Joe Sackick? I did not. I did not. No, I did. I went out one night. We went to a ball game. It was uh, Colorado Rockies and Atlanta Braves. I think it was a playoff game. It was, I mean, this is many, many years ago. And I did go with the veterans, but uh, I don't even know if I had a conversation with Joe Sack. You've made I did it. Talk to Adam, I did talk to Adam Foot a bit, and he was a really good guy. I actually met him here in the island a few years after that uh, on PEI. But uh, yeah, no, not, not a lot of time with the, with the big boys. No, that's a big boy, Adam Foot, for sure. <laughs> But so that's uh, goes right to what I was about to ask you. You run into Adam Foot out there on the island. You've made it clear, Billy, that that you love what you're doing, and it's understandable. Everybody we talked to from your part of the world talked about how much they love it out there. But if you know, we also talked about how small this world is. If one of your old maritime friends, if an, a fellow islander, gave you that call and said, "Billy, there's room for me for you on this bench here in in New York," for example, the answer oh, the call. Geez, it was New York Rangers call. If Turk called me tomorrow, I don't like. It'd be a, it'd be a quick conversation. What time do I fly out? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that, that, those, those, uh, you know, again, again, at the end of the day, that, that'd be obviously pretty special, but you know, there's not a lot of places that are going to drag me off PEI and the situation I'm in now. I, I love it here. And, you know, I have a life set up here and uh, obviously coaching's, you know, an unbelievable experience and, and it's great. And, you know, you look at it, I look at it every year. I, you know, I talked to Matt O'Death, as you guys would, would know or remember Matt O'Death was a big defenseman there in, in Kitchener, but uh, I talked to him a couple of years ago about going up to Seattle. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just, you know, I talked to Dylan Seiko about Sarnia. There's, there's, there's different opportunities that arise, but then you got to look at the big picture and say, okay, so now how do I do this? Do I move my family? Do I take the leave of absence? Like, how does, how does your life work? Like, you know, from, having a 13 to 14 year old daughters to a son. And, and, uh, you know, some coaches have taken the opportunity and sacrificed and, you know, have chased jobs and went all over the world and coached and, and, you know, come back home in the summer with their families and, and kind of leave them home. But that wasn't something that I seen that I wanted to do when I was in Regina. And, you know, from that aspect, we decided that Summerside was going to be where we raise our family. Now my kids are getting a little older now. So, you know, if the Kitchener Rangers came calling, I'd, I'd be, I'd be looking at a contract pretty deeply. That's for sure. I can't believe we didn't ask that. And I hope you see that contract one day, just for the record, but um, I can't believe we didn't ask it. What was it like having the Stanley cup in your office? You mentioned that earlier. Oh, it was pretty cool. It was pretty special. I mean, uh, so Grant Sonia, who's a, was a former coach, of the Capitals here. He had a day with the cup as a scout. And uh, anyway, we, we, you know, he was, he had a lot of stuff going on that day. He had, you know, showing at the credit union place, the rink here in Summerside, beautiful facility. Uh, he had a showing there and he had some family things going on and he had, ended up uh, extending an invite to myself, and my general manager, Pat McKeever. And so the Stanley cup was inside the rink and like the public was allowed to come see it. So Grant was kind of doing that. And, and uh, he asked me if, if he could take it into the dressing room. Like he wanted to get it, obviously it being a former Summerside Western Capitals coach coming full circle Grant has 20 years of professional hockey under his belt and, and uh, like scouting, he's been a GM, he's been an assistant GM for the Panthers. He's, he's been in the NHL and he's played coaching the minors. Like, you know, so his career was evolved right, but from Summerside. So it was pretty special for him to want to do that. What one might be invited my family and, and uh, brought it down to the dressing room. We got some pictures in there. And then I just, I just asked him, do you mind if, do you mind if we take one picture inside my office with the, with the Stanley cup there. So I ended up taking him and my son into my office and, and uh, my son's eight years old and him and Grant got a couple pictures of it together with the Stanley cup. And I got a picture of my young fella. So it was pretty cool, pretty cool experience, pretty surreal. I mean, obviously um, you know, you look back and at Grant's career and you know, you're at a place now where I think Grant's maybe, I don't know, 50 some, and you know, he's been in and out of the game a bit and, and to see him, you know, stay in the game and get back in the game, back with Tampa Bay and then win a Stanley Cup as a scout there and bring it back to his home province. Every dream and every day of this stuff. And that's why, you know, a lot of us guys stay in the game and want to be involved in the game and want to be part of the game. I think it's 
it's moments like that that really, you know, give you the opportunity to, to stay and, you know, want to work for that dream. You know, Billy, when we were setting this up, you said you weren't sure that you had any stories or stories you could remember. And here we are an hour later and it's been just, I mean, we could go another hour, I'm sure. Uh, great stories. And as always, a pleasure to talk to somebody from out there on the island. Really appreciate you doing this with us, man. It's great to hear. Yeah, no, no problem at all. It was, uh, it's great to talk to you guys. I, I got one more linger story. Do you want it or no? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you this one. This was a, this was a pretty good one. So Brad Richards, Linger and Brad Richards and our friend Trevor Burt and Brody Coffin. So the same kind of group of guys that were in that wedding party story that I told you earlier. <laughs> we went out to Tampa Bay uh, in 2004 for the Stanley Cup final. So Brad Richards, obviously being an Islander, um, Trevor Burt, scouts for the Charlottetown Islanders, real good friends with, with Brad at the time and Brody Coffin. This group of guys were all really good friends with Brad. I was kind of like the tag along that was, was, uh, was given the opportunity to go. So we went and, and Brad kind of, you know, took care of us, got a skybox. His family was there for game five. A bunch of Islanders were there for game five. So we stayed. So they, they went, uh, they went, to, they lost game five, whatever the case was, they were going to Calgary for game six, Tampa Bay. They had to win game six. So we stayed in Tampa Bay just for the chance that maybe the Stanley Cups comes back for game seven. So we stayed in Tampa Bay and we, you know, had a week there where they were going to Calgary and we, you know, had some fun and, and stayed in the hotel. And then, they won game six. We watched from a hotel room and we were like, oh my God, we're going to be here for game seven. This is going to be unbelievable. So they're coming back now. So, so Brad Richards is, is on the Tampa Bay lightning. We're in his sky box for game five and then game seven. So we're sitting in the sky box game seven, the games, you know, getting close to being over and the Tampa Bay lightning has just won the Stanley cup. We're in the building. Um, we're all pretty young at this time. I don't know, late, late twenties or whatever. And, we're still linger still playing like a lot of guys are still playing. I'm obviously not playing anymore, but we're all buddies and we're all hockey guys. And anyway, so they win the Stanley cup. So lo and behold, we're with Brad Richards. He's the con Smythe winner. So he wins the con Smythe trophy. We're with him. We go down to the rink. We go down to the ice surface. We win the dressing room. So as the night goes on, we're just having, I mean, we're having a blast. We're in the dressing room. We're, popping champagne we're you know whatever so at four o'clock in the morning we're still at the rink and everyone else is gone so we we walked around the rink we went up to there was an after party we went up with the stanley cup we carried the consmite trophy up me and linger and brody coffin and house cat trevor burt's his name and and uh, went up to the bar and you know drank into the stanley cup with the players and you know had the consmite around us so it was just a like an unbelievable, we met Hulk Hogan. We hung around with Hulk Hogan. Like it, it was just, it was incredible, incredible night. Well, at the end of the night, we challenged the Sam Boney guys to a hockey game. So we went out with, <laughs> we, we wore the Tampa Bay Lightning players gear. So me, Linger, Brody Coffin and Housecat went out and played hockey against the Sam Boney drivers at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> You've been sitting on that for an hour? Come on, that's fantastic. <laughs> it was an unbelievable experience. I thought I won the Stanley Cup that night. What a what an incredible uh, what an incredible night it was. Oh, I'm sure everyone Hogan. else. I'm sure everyone else went to bed. They didn't know the Easterners are still up. They're partying. They're like, we're not shutting this thing down. Well, we're Easterners. Well, they, they shut down the they shut down the party upstairs. I think it was three o'clock in the morning. Like they had to shut down the bar or whatever, and they were going elsewhere. But Brad just kind of said, "Well, let's just stay here." So we went downstairs back in the dressing room. So we had full reign in the rink, and the Sam Boney guys came down, and had a chat with us, and we were all primed up ready to go so we said do you want to play some hockey boys and away we went. <laughs> that is amazing hockey i mean it's when it's in you it's in you isn't oh, it's it? in, yeah yeah awesome <laughs> what a story billy, billy thanks fantastic. thanks again hey all the best uh to your father Ho hopefully he stays healthy and um good luck friday who, who do you got you miramichi yeah we got miramichi. Miramichi. back back and forth yeah home and home there next weekend so we were ranked number third today in canada so pretty good pretty good week for us uh, not too shabby for you old guys out there, eh? That's right. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Billy, thanks a lot for this. Thank you.